Hello and welcome to Introduction to Psychology. In this chapter we're going to be going over chapter one of the OpenStax textbook. My name is Matthew Poole. I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State. So let's begin. So what is psychology? What in the world is psychology? Well, Psychology is the scientific study of behavior and the mind. It gets its root, psych, or psyche, which means soul, ology, of course, being the study of, but as we know it today, it is not the study of the soul because psychology, by definition, is a science. We apply the scientific method to our understanding of behavior as well as mental processes that we are able to observe. Now, I know right off the bat you may be thinking to yourself, well, the mind, isn't that more so an abstract concept? And hey, I totally get it. So whenever it comes to, whenever we're referring to the mind, I don't love that we have to utilize this definition because it leaves room for the unobservable. And of course, whenever it comes to science, if we can't touch, feel, taste, or sense it, you know, how in the world can we act adequately study it, apply the scientific method, and it be considered empiricism. And so empiricism is ultimately uh, another term for it is the empirical method, which is based on unbiased observations. Okay, That's the biggest thing too. When it comes to science, it has to be unbiased and it has to be falsifiable. Okay, and so whenever you don't have something that's, whenever you, excuse me, whenever you have something that's uh, unobservable, you can't falsify. It's unfalsifiable. And we're going to learn throughout this course different ideas and theories regarding uh, Sigmund Freud. He thought that, or he, let me just say that he had a lot of ideas that were considered, uh, you know, unobservable or unfalsifiable, but more on that down the road. Some of the psychological perspectives that we're going to be looking at today include structuralism, functionalism, the psychoanalytic theory, with Sigmund Freud, of course, Gestalt psychology, behaviorism, as well as humanism. On top of this today, we're going to be ending on talking about different careers in psychology, you know, different jobs you can get with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate degree, as well as the distinction between a psychologist versus a psychiatrist, all right? So psychology gets its start officially in 1879 thanks to the help of Wilhelm Wundt at the University of Leipzig in Germany, okay? And so what Wundt was very much focused on was a concept, his school of thought, known as structuralism. So structuralism, ultimately, the reason that Wundt came up with this idea is you know, trying to model psychology after the hard sciences. So how can we break down psychology, um, or at that time he was wanting to look at consciousness, how can we break down consciousness into elements similar to like chemistry? Because with chemistry, you've got your chemical compounds, and ultimately with structuralism, he is wanting to... Um, model that after, you know, something like chemistry where we're breaking down the, uh, you know, consciousness into elements where maybe if we can break it down that way, we can understand it a little bit more. And how he, you know, started to study it or tried to, what he tried to apply to structuralism is what's known as introspection. So introspection is trying to examine your own conscious experience. And I like to use the oxymoron, you know, trying to look inward objectively. And so that's oxymoronic because we can't look inward and make observations our, about ourselves in an unbiased manner, in an objective manner. Anytime you add the human element to what you're trying to study and trying to make it scientific, it's not going to work long term. So this is why structuralism ultimately kind of phased out, as well as consciousness in general is an unobservable entity. Okay, So Whenever we move toward a little bit later with William James, James thought that behavior or more so, you know, mental functions is what he was more so focused on. Behaviorism comes a little bit later. He was concerned about how mental activities help us to adapt and to survive and to advance. So he's a big theory of evolution guy. So functionalism truly emphasized on how mental activities contribute to basic environmental survival, hence functionalism. So that was 
with William James, one of the first Western uh, psychologists or first American psychologists you can thank for functionalism. Now, too, we've got another individual who, if you've ever heard about psychology, you know of Sigmund Freud. Now, Freud has the concept of the psychoanalytic theory. So it's a theory as well as he's got his therapy known as psychoanalysis. A lot of people have heard of psychoanalysis before. Now, the main tenet behind the psychoanalytic theory is that he thought that your mental difficulties as an adult were due to... Uh, you know, difficulties or problems in your childhood. So when there was trauma in the childhood, that could potentially manifest into mental difficulties as an adult. On top of that, he thought a lot of our difficulties arise from the unconscious mind. Okay, so we're learn going to learn about the id, ego, super ego, his, his theory of the personality. But ultimately, he thinks that because uh, we're unaware of what's causing us difficulties, that's why it's manifesting in other behavioral deficits or difficulty. Okay. Now, on top of this, he had the psychoanalysis, which psychoanalysis is a form of therapy where he would utilize what's known as free association. So free association is just another term for saying allowing the client to talk about whatever comes to mind so Freud can make connections to the unconscious mind and bring what's unconscious to consciousness. And that would at least be the first step in alleviating mental difficulty. Okay. Another thing that he would try to do is try to analyze your dreams. Now, although he tried to, and you know, a lot of people probably believed him at that time, we don't have an objective or unbiased or scientific way in which we can analyze your dreams even up until this point. But it didn't stop him from trying to do so. Now, another funny thing that Freud kind of uh, was credited with is known as malapropisms. So these are what's known as slips of the tongue. Or Freudian slip. So according to Freud, he's a big determinist, which basically means that whenever you engage in a behavior, there was a prior reason for why you engaged in that particular behavior. It has been determined for you. Okay. And so according to Freud, if you, you know, accidentally do something, apparently to Freud, there's no such thing as an accident. There is a reason behind it. So if you accidentally call your current partner by your ex-partner's name, well, to Freud, that could use a little bit of analyzing. All right, moving forward. So that's Freud there to the left, a little bit of an image of him as well as one of the textbooks that he created, a general introduction to psychoanalysis. A huge figure, and although a lot of his ideas are unfalsifiable, a lot of his uh, theories are unfalsifiable, we still needed him to be an earlier figure to at least get us started and to build upon. So Freud gets a lot of flack, but again, anytime you're starting a new science or a new field of study, there's going to be hiccups, there's going to be mistakes, there's going to be a lot of things that people will look back on and criticize, but then again, we don't have the resources that we do today to be able to, to you know, you know, make ourselves act like we're you know a little bit better than we are you know we have to humble ourselves and understand that things take time and if we were to start a new field of study ourselves people would look back on us as well and see and criticize the mistakes that we made okay so moving forward so we have what's known as gestalt psychology the main principle behind gestalt which means whole is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts so this uh, gestalt psychology is based on the idea that Although a sensory experience can be broken down into those individual parts, how those parts relate to each other as a whole is often what the individual responds to in perception. So this is something that we're going to explore a little bit later when it comes to our sensation and perception chapter. Because thought psychology was huge in sensation and perception. Now a few of the earlier figures, Kohler, Kafka, and Wertheimer were German psychologists who immigrated the United States to escape Nazi Germany. So they have a very intriguing story that I encourage you to look into, but they were those earlier figures to introduce us to Gestalt psychology. Okay, moving forward, we have what's known as behaviorism, but under the behaviorism tenet, we have Ivan Pavlov, who is credited with uh, and you know often associated with, for you know, pun intended, I guess, there classical conditioning. So, everybody has at least probably at one point heard of Pavlov's dogs. 
And But before we get into all of that, I, throughout this course, am going to say the word stimulus very often, okay? So a stimulus is literally anything, person, place, or thing that elicits a response in an organism, okay? And so under classical conditioning with Ivan Pavlov, he was able to train a dog to salivate to the ringing of a bell. Well, how do you do that overall? This is something that we're going to get a little bit more into depth whenever we get into chapter six, learning. But we as humans, as you'll learn, and the animals in general, are really good association machines. We're not as great memory machines, okay, but we are really good at associating two or more stimuli together. That's why whenever you're studying and you create an acronym for a particular long form either paragraph or terminology that you have to learn for your science classes. When you break it down into like PIMDAS or whatever the case is, it's a lot easier to remember that stuff because we're strong association machines, right? And so classical conditioning goes a little bit more into depth. Classical conditioning is quite simply learning from association, like we already do, but it helps us to anticipate events, right? So in general, we're training our reflexes. Food naturally causes a reflex within us. So whenever we see, especially when we're hungry, we see or smell our favorite food, we may begin to salivate similar to a dog, right? And before we condition or pair the two stimuli, the food with a bell, the bell that has no response and especially doesn't cause you to salivate, right? It may get your attention briefly, but it's not going to cause any sort of reflex or natural reflex that you're born with, okay? Now, what we'll do whenever we are training you to associate associate something to anticipate an event, we will ring a bell and right after that or simultaneously we will have the food present. And of course a dog is really good at learning uh, this as well as you've probably done this either nat either you know intentionally or unintentionally. Over time and pretty quickly you're going to learn to associate and that dog is going to learn to associate that the bell equals food is about to arrive. So the bell will elicit a reflex but it's not a natural reflex now it's a conditioned reflex, okay? So that's classical conditioning in a nutshell. All I really want you to take away from this particular slide today is that a stimulus equals anything, person, place, or thing that elicits a response. So that is like food, water, your, uh, you know, candy, whatever the case, any person, place, or thing that elicits a response in you. As well, classical conditioning, thanks to Ivan, pa Ivan Pavlov, is the understanding that we uh, learn from association to anticipate events, classical conditioning. Now, the overall umbrella that this is underneath, classical conditioning as well as operant conditioning, is known as behaviorism. Now, with behaviorism, you can thank John B. Watson for being the father of this very school of thought. And so Watson was a big proponent for, you know, hey, listen, guys, objective analysis of the mind is impossible. It's an unobservable entity that you're uh, looking after here. Let's try and focus on something that we can actually study and measure and come to conclusions on. So the, he introduced the concept of behavior uh, in, of an, as an uh, objective in which we should look into. Okay, And so Watson, he was an American psychologist who he started at... Uh, he was, he was a professor at Johns Hopkins University, but then he turned into a marketer. And this is something that I tell my students consistently, especially if you're going into business, marketing, etc. If you really want to be successful, and John Watson's a great example of this, having a decent understanding or maybe even minoring in psychology is a decent idea because you're going to need to learn about people in business, how to motivate them to buy, what motivates them to buy, to sell, what keeps their attention, what doesn't keep their attention, always trying to keep your finger on the pulse of understanding the understanding human behavior in general. So because Watson has a good understanding of psychology, he took his understanding of this and went into, uh, into business and was wildly successful. So professor turned marketer, and you can thank him, especially here in the United States, for the term of the coffee break. Okay, so it, here even till this day, decades 
almost centuries later, we still use what's known as coffee break and uh, here in the United States, and that's because of Watson. And what, another thing that Watson thought of was that he thought that you know every baby is born with a blank slate. It's strictly, again, behaviorism is the idea that you are trained through your environment. It's you know, they discount genetics very heavily, behaviorists do. And it's all about, hey, I can train through environmental experience. I can train this baby into being whatever I want it to be, a doctor, lawyer, or shoot, even serial killer, I guess you could say. But um, the thing that Watson is most known for as far as his experiment is the little Albert experiment, which is something that we'll dive into a little bit later. Operant conditioning this is thanks to B.F. Skinner. So operant conditioning is learning from our consequences. So we have things such as positive and negative reinforcement and punishment, which we'll dive into even more down the way. But B.F. Skinner, you can thank for operant conditioning. He really concentrated on how behavior is affected by its consequences and how it can be modified through reinforcement and punishment and you are going to have a really good understanding of this down the road to where you can apply this to your own life and uh, either in business whatever occupation you go into or even just your day-to-day -day life all right this offering condition is a really good thing to have a better understanding of all right now moving forward we have the concept of humanism so the main thing with humanism is that it inspired an, a whole therapeutic approach as well but humanism in general just believes and emphasizes the potential for good in humans and this is something that can potentially be on a test for you if you're watching this and you're in my class uh, humanists believe in the potential for good in humans that you have it in you it just needs to be facilitated out of you another earlier figure of uh, humanism that's really important to know is Abraham Maslow and he created what's known as the Maslow's hierarchy of needs so this is under motivation too in the sense of what motivates us you know we can't really worry about family friendship intimacy and belonging if we don't know where our next meal is coming from so food water shelter and warmth then he think sees it as a hierarchy once we achieve that then we can move to the next stage of security safety employment assets so on and so forth until we reach the very peak which is what's known as self actualization which is complete inner fulfillment but again we can't wor worry about inner fulfillment we can't be motivated to worry about it if we again don't know where our next meal is coming from or uh, if we're going to have shelter for that night okay another very big uh, and influential uh, proponent for humanism is Carl Rogers he is credited as at developing a client-centered therapy method okay that has been really influential in the clinical settings as I have previously mentioned okay so Rogers ultimately believed that therapists need a few tenets unconditional positive regard firstly so unconditional positive regard as simply as I can make it means that you approach and meet the client for who they are no matter what they've done or where they've been okay unconditional positive regard meeting them as a blank slate which is really hard to do as a counselor or therapist because especially if somebody has done something that hits personally at home to you it's going to be really hard to, to try and be as unbiased and provide them unconditional positive regard meeting them as a blank slate for who they are no matter what they've done or where they've been okay so easier said than done but it is important for an appropriate and proper therapist according to Rogers he also believes in genuineness as well as empathy so being able not just to sympathize you know feeling sorry for somebody but actually being able to feel the emotions of others being in the shoes placing yourself in the shoes of other people and having an understanding of why they feel the way they do okay Moving forward. So toward the 1950s, we have the cognitive revolution. As science uh, as well as technology improves, we had in computer science, 
continues to improve, we have the ability to scan our brain and we have this new field of study that's known as neuroscience, which is the science which is the study of the nervous system. So we look at things from a neuroscientific perspective in this course. Um, and there's a ch it's chapter three, but we go over what's known as biopsychology. So how does biology as well as psychology intermingle? How do your genetics influence your behavior as well as how does the nervous system intermingle with that? And how do uh, changes to your nervous system or um, impact you behaviorally as as well as just we're gonna dive into the inner workings of that particular field of study more in depth. It's a super interesting chapter. It's one of my favorites. And so Noam Chomsky was a very influential figure at the beginning of the cognitive revolution. He believed that psychology needed to incorporate mental functioning into its focus in order to understand human behavior. So for the longest time, Psychology's definition was the scientific study of behavior and mental processes, which some may credit to it. If you Google it, that may be what pops up. But as far as for the OpenStack psychology textbook, the definition that we are abiding by is the scientific study of behavior and the mind. Okay, so now, of course, psychology didn't just stay as the overall arching, you know, field. There are sub branches of the uh, field of study. So we have biopsychology, like I mentioned, sensation and perception, a chapter that we're, we'll go over as well as cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, personality, social health, IO, sports and exercise, clinical, as well as forensic psychology. Forensic psychology is something that interests people pretty significantly. I've already mentioned ultimately what biopsychology is. It's the integration of how biology as well as psychology intermingles, as well as the study of the nervous system and how that uh, impacts behavior, how, uh, you know, issues with the central nervous system can impact who you are behaviorally. But we'll get into that more down the road. We also have what's known as sensation and perception. So we're going to look at how we, it's effectively like bring, breathing in and out. You can't have one without the other. You have sensory information, which is just sensation. But as we know, perception is in the eye of the beholder. We all can be receiving the same sensory information, but depending on your background, your influences, you, you just your environment in general, can influence how you see the world. So they say a lot of things in life are this much percent uh, psychological, and it's true. What they're meaning is it's based on your perception, how you interpret, uh, you know, what is happening to you. I think some person said at one point, life is like you know, 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And I think that's just a, a, you know, very distant way of saying, you know, perceptions in the eye of the beholder. We can all be rece receiving the same sensory information, but interpreting it differently. So more on that later. We also have cognitive psychology. Again, folks, anytime I say, and this is an important thing to note here, anytime in this course I'm referring to cognition specifically, I'm referring to your thoughts. So we're going to dive into cognitive behavioral therapy a little bit whenever we get into chapter 16, and we're going to loop it all in together. But overall, cognition really encompasses attention, problem solving, language, as well as memory. Okay. We also have the field of study known as developmental psychology. So if you're a student at uh, our particular college, you can take this as an entire class. Now, developmental psychology is quite simply the study of how you develop socially, emotionally, cognitively, and physically from birth to death. And we analyze all those things. And a big figure uh, for this was Jean Piaget. There are multitude. I mean, there are a number of developmental psychologists that we could go through, uh, but we would be here for an entire semester if we did so. But to introduce you to a really influential figure, it's Jean Piaget there in the left, um, the picture on the left there. Most people know him from the theory, from his theory of cognitive development. Okay. Moving forward, we also have what's known as personality psychology. So personality refers to the long-standing traits that propel you to consistently think, feel, as well as behave. Now, there are a lot of, well, I think there are at least a couple personality assessments that are pretty good, 
but the one of the earliest forms that is was considered by academics as the gold standard is what's known as the five factor model it can be remembered by the acronym ocean remember I said that it's a lot easier to remember or associate items whenever we have an acronym versus whenever we're just trying to remember it in general association machine pretty good at memory machine not so good at so we'll go into the uh, five-factor model a little bit more as well as personality assessment some of the ones that I think you should try out but uh, this acronym ocean tests you on your openness if you score high or low in it are you open to imagination feelings actions conscientiousness are you more so if you score high in it are you more so hardworking dependable organized lower in it are you more impulsive extroversion we all know about extroverts and introverts, but more on that later. If you score high in extroversion, you know that you're outgoing, warm, seek adventure, energized by being around others. If you're introverted or score low on extroversion, you're more so reserved, quiet, um, are motivated by working alone, things like that. Agreeableness, if you score high in it, you're more helpful, trusting, and empathetic. Okay, I'm, I'm somebody that scores pretty high in agreeableness. Uh, so for my agreeable people out there, I shout you out. Lower in agreeableness, these people are pretty uncooperative, suspicious, critical, they're you know in general just disagreeable I hate to just use the term there in it but you know they're more likely to argue their position or be more uh, like I said like I just said critical of uh, your statements or what is going on in the world neuroticism now neuroticism does not mean that you're crazy okay if you score high in neuroticism in this five-factor model this means that you have a higher propensity for um, having negative emotions such as anxiousness, unhappiness, depression, pr just prone to negative emotions in general. If you score low in it, you're more calm, even-tempered, as well as secure. Okay. Social psychology. Now, social psychology refers to, um, you know, and people will ask me this in class, what's the difference between social psychology versus sociology? So social psychology is looking at an individual and how they behave in a group setting. So it's looking at still looking at the individual, but in a group setting. Now, alternatively, uh, sociology is more so looking at group behavior as a whole, group dynamics, things like that. So sociology, the group as a whole, social psychology, individual in a group setting. Okay, And we're going to learn a lot about some different studies and some unethical studies that would not hold up today, but they told us a lot about how we interact and are influenced by other people. And this can be due to, you know, um, obedience from authority. This can be just trying to uh, fit in with a crowd, things like that. So we'll get into all that a little bit later. Now there's also a field such as health psychology. So these individuals will focus on the biological, social, as well as the psychological. One of the things that my uh, primary care physician tells me all the time, the biological and the psychological intermingle. Whenever there's a difficulty with one, it can really impact the other. So do not discount your mental health uh, as well and or I guess I, I should say your biological or physical health because when you neglect one it can kind of influence the other it's all intermingled and that's what health psychologists are really focused on uh, making sure that the body is taken care of but also the mind because who are we really without our mind clinical psychology so this focuses on the diagnosis and the treatment of mental disorders or problematic behavior things like that so there's a whole chapter that we're gonna cover that goes through multiple mental disorders so this is really a chapter to um, to wait for and to and, and to tune in for because if you in, are interested in learning about mental difficulties or mental disorders through the DSM-5 that's gonna be um, a crowd favorite I guess I should say so that'll be chapter 15 if you'd like to skip ahead uh, you're more than welcome to do so okay moving forward some other contemporary uh, fields of study within psychology industrial organizational has been taking off so that's looking at you know how to make the workplace environment a more fruitful a more healthy as well as a more productive environment sports and exercise psychology there's no question that athletes are under tremendous 
amount of anxiety as well as stress whenever they're engaging in their respective sport. Okay, so we need if we're trying, we can you know work out all day long, practice, practice, practice our physical, and that can be on point. But a lot of sports is there's a huge mental component. You can debate how much of a percentage that is. That's fine, but you can't lie that there is at least a portion of the mental or the psychology that goes into your performance. Okay, and so that's what exercise and as sports psychologists do is really uh, assist these athletes on the mental end so they can be their uh, best performing self physically on the field. Forensic psychology. This is one of the fields of study that interests many, many people. Uh, now, the thing that TV shows, they may kind of over-dramatize what forensic psychologists do. A lot of what they'll be doing is including uh, assessments of individuals' mental competency to stand in trial, the sentencing and treatment suggestions, as well as advisement regarding eyewitness testimony. This particular field of study really requires a strong understanding of the legal system. Okay, So a very fruitful career. Um, and it's going to need to, you're going to need to at least achieve a doctorate degree. Okay. Speaking of those distinctions, let's get into, this is the only time in the course or throughout this series that I am going to convince you or try to sell you a degree in psychology. Now, before you major in psychology and the undergraduate level, it is a good thing to keep in mind that a lot of careers within the field and especially within mental health are going to require at least a graduate degree, so a master's or beyond. Okay, So what are the things you can do with a bachelor's degree? Well, uh, it's good to have an understanding of psychology in general, but if you have a degree in it, those prospects are looking like a few of the ones below. You can engage in social work, be a case manager um, for the state, that, the respective state that you're in. Uh, you can be, you can go back and or stay in the college setting, work in administration or be a part of the staff. So you can work in admissions, you can work in financial aid, be a, an admissions counselor or a financial aid counselor. I don't love that we use those terms, uh, you know, counselor whenever an individual does doesn't have a counseling degree, but that is usually what the colleges will call them. So that's how I'm referring to them. I may disagree, but I'm just I'm going to go along with uh, their particular verbiage. So when you see it, you can apply for it. So you can uh, assist students as they're navigating their their federal aid, or as they're transitioning from high school to college, or you can sell your uh, respective college. So if you're being like a recruiter then you can go out and you have, if you have an understanding of psychology, you can interact with people a lot more effectively, in my opinion, and maybe, you know, improve the uh, overall enrollment count of your respective college. So something to keep in mind, but there are other avenues that you can get into. It's not just limited to admissions and financial aid. You can also get into business and marketing. Again, understanding humans, what motivates them to want to buy, to sell, to, you know, uh, just anything involving business. Uh, the human element of business and marketing is going to be really impacted by having a degree in psychology. Now, I encourage you, of course, if you're wanting to get into those particular fields of study, get a degree in business and or marketing uh, and maybe minor in psychology. But if you'd like to, you just find psychology super fascinating, you want to keep with it, by all means, get a degree in it, okay? And maybe minor in business or marketing, okay? Now, lastly, you can be a behavior technician, so you can assist these counselors or psychiatrists or psychologists in a clinical setting. Okay, so that's a few of the careers you can do with a bachelor's degree. Now, with a master's degree, now strictly in psychology, because psychology and counseling, those are, are they're you know related fields in that they kind of hover around the same information relatively speaking psychology if you get a master's degree in it is likely going to be pretty research focused and less on the practice focus okay so you're focusing on the research of psychology whereas counseling you are implementing the uh, a therapeutic approach okay you're wanting to actually go into practice now with a master's degree strictly in psychology you can become a college lecturer. That's what I did. I have a master's degree in uh, general psychology, so I became a community college lecturer. 
You can engage in clinical or experimental research, and then you can move that forward into a PhD at, a, at the respective college of your choice. Again, count, uh, psychology versus counseling. Psychology focuses on research. Counseling, it can focus on research depending on your program, but more so what you're going to be doing is focusing on your internships and getting the adequate amount of hours to be able to sit eventually for what's known as your LPC or license professional counselor okay now the counseling degree is going to take at least 60 credit hours um, now if you're going into like school counseling the the uh, requirements are going to be potentially a little bit less um, depending on the school that you go to so it's not an LPC route it's just a master's degree in school counseling and you can be a guidance counselor at a local school but if you're wanting to eventually get into behavioral or clinical and mental health counseling marriage and family uh, things like that then you are going to get a master's with 60 credit hours that can lead you to getting and being able to sit for your LPC after you know so many Hours. So once you get your master's degree, that's really when the work starts for counseling. It's a bit of a process to become a counselor, and it may vary from state to state. Uh, but here in the state of Tennessee, it's about 3,000 hours um, after you graduate just to be able to sit for your LPC. Okay, And so that's it. as you can see, it, it takes a while for these counselors to eventually become licensed, but they can still work in the meantime as they're getting their hours and, and they can get paid for it. They're just not uh, an LPC. They have to be under the supervision of an individual. Okay, And something that people will ask me is like, you know, do counselors prescribe medications or do they diagnose you or what what's the difference between like a counselor versus a psychologist versus a psychiatrist so i'm going to speak for the state of tennessee specifically yes and no a counselor can diagnose in our state now if you're just an lpc if you have your lpc you cannot diagnose individuals you can treat individuals and assist them through their mental difficulties but if you want to be able to diagnose, you have to take a little bit more coursework, um, focus on you know diagnosing individuals, and uh, that's called a mental health service provider. So you'd be an LPC MHSP. So it takes a little bit more hours, a little bit more training, things like that. But then counselors can at that point diagnose, but they cannot prescribe medications and neither can psychologists in most states now more states are allowing psychologists to prescribe medications but psychologists whenever we're referring to a psychologist this is any individual who has a doctorate degree in psychology so this could be a phd a psyd things like that so they do have um you know, they're, throughout their program, they probably have focused on, especially when it comes to clinical psychology, they've focused on um, treating individuals, but uh, they cannot prescribe medication. They can treat and diagnose, but unfortunately cannot prescribe medication because they, we have psychiatrists for this. Psychiatrists are individuals who have gone to medical school. They have a medical doctorate or a doctor of osteopathic medicine, a DO in psychiatry, and they're so they're able to um, diagnose as well as treat individuals. So that's the main difference. Counselor uh, can treat, cannot prescribe medication. They some can diagnose. Psychologists they can diagnose and they can treat, but they cannot prescribe medication. A psychiatrist can kind of do all of that. They can treat, they can prescribe medication, and they can diagnose. Okay, and there are multiple, you know, labels of psychologists. Like I said, clinical, experimental, social, developmental, counseling, sports, so on and so forth. Now, if that wasn't enough for you with a doctorate degree in psychology, you can also become a college, university, or professor. So all you need is a master's degree with 18 hours in your respective field to become like a lecturer or you know at a community college or maybe even at a, at a university you can become a lecturer. But uh, to get a, a you know better chance of becoming employed in a college or university setting, especially at a four-year university, a PhD is going to likely be a, um, a, a safe bet for you is what I'll leave it at. Okay, so that will complete chapter one 
of the OpenStax Psychology Textbook. As I've mentioned, I always want to mention, if I haven't done so already, all the slides that I showed you were given to me by an open resource uh, website. So these are not my own. I am simply um, relaying them to you all through this uh, lecture. So I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you in Chapter 2.